So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Adolfa Pires uh, from Macai, Brazil, who will uh, talk today about oil displacement by multi-component chemical slugs. Adolfa, uh, it's your word. Okay. Uh, thank you, Julian. It's a pleasure for me to be here to make this presentation for you. And let me see, say something. Dobre day. Is it correct? Yes. I don't, you didn't, okay. It's my Brazilian accent. I don't know if it works for good afternoon for you. For me, it's morning. For, for you, it's afternoon. I don't know if it's the same. But it's my pleasure to be here to make this presentation. And I hope that you all like that. And, and let me talk just a little bit about myself, just to introduce me briefly. Uh, my background is chemical engineering, and I took my master's and PhD in petroleum. I was also talking to Yulia, and very and many thanks to Yulia for this invitation. And I was talking to Yulia. My PhD advisor was Pavel Bedrikavetsky. Of course, I don't know the how to speak correctly, but my this presentation. I will talk about the displacement by, of oil by water slugs containing multi-component solvent chemicals. And along the presentation, I will talk a little about why slugs injection is important for oil industry, why we decided to study and evaluate this, this way of mod, this model. Okay, go. This is a brief outline, and this is I will just talk about the enhanced oil recovery. And along this review, I will just say the most important papers, half a dozen of papers that are important for the background where I based my research, my inspiration, and also the mathematical model. I know that you all know that very in very details and finally the the solution that we prepared for the end component and the important point here is that we consider the um, polymer or the chemical components absorption and along this presentation i will always show you polymer polymer and polymer but it's in fact it uh, works for any chemical dissolved absorb if it absorbs or, or not Okay, uh, just put in perspective where enhanced oil recovery works. The primary recovery is based on the natural energy of the reservoir. Let's say the solution gas drive where you only have liquid, you only have oil in the reservoir. The gas cap, if you have um, a two-phase reservoir, let's say the oil in the bottom, at the bottom and the gas at the top. We have the gas liquid equilibrium. And also the aquifer. Of course, you have the oil then, in this case, at the top and then aquifer. All these three recoveries, let's say, they do not allow us to get very high recovery factors. And it will depend much on the geometry and the activity and the aquifer, if it's active or not, if it, uh, the, um, Porosity, permeability of the aquifer zone in general, they are not very good. So it's almost a, a rule. Everyone, every reservoir uh, should have some way of keeping pressure at some level. And of course, most common is the water flooding because it's easy and cheap. You can get water and then displace the oil. But of course, it works fine, and I believe that I, I cannot, I don't remember figures, exact figures, but I can say that most of the produced oil is produced by water flooding. I don't know the figures, if 60%, 70%, I don't know, but I can assure you it's most. But there are some cases or some conditions that water flooding is not the best 
technique, or even if you have get you have gotten a high recovery factor through water flooding, and you need to or you want to, or it's possible to recover more oil. So you look for or you try to do another technique that we call enhanced oil recovery. Sometimes people call it tertiary because it comes after secondary. And these are the thermal, miscible, and chemical techniques. And this is the focus of my presentation. Of course, I will talk only about chemical, but let's say the, this mathematical model, it also can be used for miscible flooding. And uh, we can talk about that on another occasion. And we have also some research on thermal maps, but more on uh, thermal miscible methods. And we have some research on that. Let me ask you just before continue, can you hear me okay? I should talk louder. Um, and you also can see this point here, the cursor. Oh, I hear you very good. Okay, well. perfect. thank you. And you can also follow here in my point in the enhanced. Yes, and we can see a point. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, uh, just briefly talking about each of each technique, the thermal recovery when you, of course, inject steam to increase temperature around the well bore and decrease the oil viscosity so it flows better, easier to the oil producer well. Miscible flooding is very interesting, especially because of carbon dioxide now. And when you inject some gas or, of course, a mixture of components to displace oil. And this is very interesting from the thermodynamics and the physical point of view because you have mass exchange. You have um, components from the gas phase mixing with the liquid phase and also some liquid components are extracted to the gas phase. In this slide in particular, we are, I'm showing here the water alternated gas using CO2. It's um, a very interesting technique because the CO2 has some physical properties that allow um, a better recovery because of its viscosity and also its density with along the pressure and temperature of the reservoir. It's a very interesting. This is something that I I'm working with a student, and it's a PhD student. Very nice, uh, very nice technique. But we are far from the uh, the final results. And now our goal here is about chemical flooding. What's a chemical flooding is you inject water containing chemical components. They may be polymers, surfactants, uh, micellar solutions, etc. And what's the idea? I'll talk about polymers in particular. Polymers, they increase the viscosity of the water solution, of the water injected. So it gets a better mobility ratio for the oil. So it decreases the mobility of the water phase. But polymers are expensive. And what happens that the continuous reservoir oil flooding, continuous flooding of the reservoir of, with water containing chemicals, it's an expensive and also not so effective. What I mean not so effective is that if I inject a, a finite slug of water containing chemicals, and then I displace this slug with water, the final recovery result will be approximately the same. Of course, the uncertainties of the reservoir, all the heterogeneities of the reservoir, they play a much more important role than the, the amount of the chemical injected, let's say, of the, I'm saying the amount comparing the continuous with the slug. The, the difference between the continuous in water flooding containing chemicals and the slug injection is much smaller than the effect of other, other properties of the reservoir. So that's the main point why we like or we seek for slug injection. Right? Of course, for the in the operational point of view, there are other you have to inject a, a slug to 
to not to avoid contact of the water with polymer with the oil and some other uh, cares you have to take but from the mathematical and physical point of view we are injecting chemical uh, water containing chemical components displacing by pure water let's say we call it water drive Okay, now I will talk about some of the some of the important papers that I the most important papers that I used in the beginning of my research long time ago, working with Pado. This paper of Wagner in 87 and Journal of Differential Equations, uh, he shows the, the change of independent variables. The, the what we did in the similar way that he proposed when he trained change to from a lot Eulerian to Lagrangian coordinates of gas dynamics and it's has all the detailed proof of the of the change of variables and those are the two papers the Bedrika Vex and Chumak and Yentov and Voskov and both published in the European Conference of Mathematics Oil Recovery, they, they show, they suggest a similar approach of Wagner's work of variable change to solve gas flooding, oil, oil reservoirs, gas flooding, accounting for mass exchange. In fact, I will not show here, of course, but uh, we can follow exactly the same procedure and the step by step and find similar solutions because we can write the thermodynamic equilibrium, gas liquid equilibrium, in a similar fashion of the absorption effects, similar to Langmuir adsorption, isotherm, Henry, Henry uh, equilibrium ratios. So, this is some important points and these three ones from and this jo johansen winter and veto i don't know how to spell they developed a human solver for a two-phase component multi-component process and they apply exactly for polymer flooding in, in fact what they show is they they follow all the mathematical proofs all the um, the techniques and all this behavior, the solutions, you can mimic a multi-component polymer, uh, N plus one system of equations to a two by two system of equations. They show how the set of polymer concentrations can be considered or regarded as one concentration. Let's say it's one in the space, would be space of concentrations. Each point would be like similar uh, one concentration in the solution that the classical solution when we solve in the uh, saturation fractional flow space. And this was very inspiring because uh, for continuous flooding, all the proofs are there, they are correct. But when you inject slug, when you have a different boundary conditions, when the boundary condition changes with time, then we have the wave interactions. And they do not uh, take this into account in their solutions. That was the, let's say, the main focus of our research with Pado 20 years ago, when we, we wanted to not generalize because their solution is general and it's correct and all the details, but we want to use this approach for slug injections, for wave interaction. And what helped us a lot, of course, was the Hiaris and Amundsen solution. I will talk about that later. So uh, our presentation, my presentation will focus on three steps, let's say. First, I, I present the relationship between the complete mathematical problem, let's say, and the splitting technique that and Johansen does not show in these terms, but we recall this splitting. And then I show how he added in the moon some 
and solve the one-phase chromatography that was also used by Johansen to solve the two-phase problem. And, and, and then I will show this last paper that we published, that is the N plus one N components polymer displacement considering language adsorption isotherm. So just beginning with the model, we also we consider one dimension, of course, and we are displacing oil by water. Here we have the rock. And this water contains polymers and salt. As I said, it's I'm right here in the general way. And the polymers in the water, they each one has a C concentration and they can be absorbed by the rock. They don't have to. The solution can be used, used if there is no absorption. But in our model, it can be absorbed in general. And this is uh, an approach that can be used for low salinity water flooding also. So the basic assumption of, of the problem is one dimensional. We consider isothermal flow. Porous media is homogeneous. The system is incompressible, rock and fluids. Uh, dispersion, gravity, and capillarity, they are not considered. And this is an important point. The chemical components are dissolved only in aqueous phase. And I believe that we can generalize with a partition function and the chemical components can be in the oil phase. We solved that problem for continuous flooding. We did not work it on uh, slug injection. And another point because is the water density does not depend on the chemical components concentration, because in that case, we had to keep the, the density in the equations. So, okay. so we, we write the water conservation. This is the classical butler lab solution uh, equation. C is the porosity. Uh, I dropped the double subscript to indicate water. So S is the water salvation. U is the total velocity. And as the system is incompressible, the velocity is the same at any point of the domain. And F is the fractional flow. It depends on the relative permeabilities and viscosity. As usual, we write these two dimensional lens variables, the relative position and the number of pore volumes injected. So we can rewrite the water conservation in the dimensional lens form. You know that always says that I should not call dimensional lens, but I'm used to that. <laughs> so we can write. But this is dimensional lens, yes? Yes, I say dimensionless, but then always correct me. No, it's not dimensionless. It's known. I he said something, and I, I'm used to say that, so I always say wrong. <laughs> and then we, we can write also the conservation, mass conservation of each component for the end components. Here, C is the concentration of the component I in water, and AI is the amount absorbed by the rock. And then we have we need a relationship between the absorbed amount and the concentration. In this case, this relationship, and I'm not assuming anyone, it may depend only on the concentration of the component itself, or in a more general fashion, the amount absorbed may depend on the concentration, sorry, of the all of all of the components in water phase. That's it. For the sake of generality, we can consider at this point, of course, language also, that the amount absorbed depends on the concentration of all species in the water phase. Here is the example of the fractional flow function. And we define fractional flow function as the water velocity divided by total velocity. And when we apply Darcy's law, the fractional flow, flow function is given by the inverse of one plus the water, the inverse of the mobility radius or the 
oil mobility divided by water mobility. So this is a classical. There is not, of course, there is not only this shape, but in general we have the S shape for the fractional flow function. And here is each of these curves is a um, fractional flow curve for a constant set of concentrations, right? So the water viscosity depends on the water, on the concentration of the chemical species and the relative permeability of the water may depend on the concentration. It, this is a general expression. In our model, or our model, in the solution I'm presenting here, the relative permeability curves does not depend on the concentration. They don't, they depend only on the saturation. We keep the dependence on the water mobility only on the water viscosity. So each one of these fractional flow curves is for a specific and fixed set of concentrations. And here is um, the approach similar to Wagner. And it's detailed by, and we don't see that in Johansen papers, Johansen and collaborators' papers. They keep the, the independent variables X and T, and they just show the relationship between the waves. And here we make uh, we change independent variables similar to Wagner because this is the way we found to solve the hyperbolic equation that appears. So when we apply, we define a potential that is a kind of Lagrangian coordinates for the water flow. Okay. And of course, we have the partial derivative of the phi with respect to T is the fractional flow. And with respect to X is minus the saturation of water. Here again, water fractional flow, water saturation. And then through Green's formula, we can rewrite the closed domain with respect to the potential. And then we achieve this, what we call auxiliary system. What's the very interesting point here? And this system of equations, the water saturation and the um, chemical components concentration, it's coupled through the fractional flow concentration, sorry, fractional flow function. So it depends on the concentration and so on. This system of equations, of course, is N by N, the other ones N plus one, they just depend on the concentrations and adsorption. So this is the equation of one phase chromatography. It's exactly the same. So if, if we can solve the equations for the one phase chromatography and the relationship that we are going to show, okay, they hold for the auxiliary system and the, let's say the initial system or complete system, we can relate the solution of the auxiliary system to the general solution. So if, we can do that. We can solve the auxiliary system for a set of initial and boundary conditions. Then we have an hyperbolic equation that we can find when we apply the change of coordinates to the water conservation. So if we do that, we have the concentration and saturation in this new coordinate space. And then we have to do, we have to perform the inverse mapping. So we have X and T, and all the solutions in X phi are mapped into the X T. So in this space, we solve the auxiliary system based on thermodynamics. And then we map the solution to the X T that using through these hyperbolic equations, we include the what we call hydrodynamics, that's the fractional flow that presents the relative permeability curves and viscosities. So this is the, let's say, step-by-step -step solution. Now here I am trying to show the mapping of the 
initial conditions of the or the human problem in both spaces. We have the initial condition for any, any left and right saturations and any left and right concentrations. And they are straight lines with slope, the saturations at the right and at left conditions. If the initial reservoir saturation, water saturation is zero or we normalize, we just change variables to be zero, this new saturation, the initial condition at the left, at the right, sorry, will be exactly relay on the X, X, like the XC problem. And also if we're saying a boundary volume problem, when we have the injection of 100% of water, the boundary condition will map exactly on the phi x. Okay. And so this is the relationship between the self similar variables of the xt plane and the phi x plane. Here I, I write this meta self similar variable for the auxiliary system, uh, phi divided by x, but we can do anyway x divided by phi and to be one divided by meta. And this is exactly the base of the solution that Johansen presented. He, he shows he doesn't use this self similar variable for the auxiliary system, but he shows that this point here is related to the and velocities or the characteristic velocities or the characteristic waves of the one phase chromatography based on his works. So now we'll go through every every every, every wave and the characteristic waves, the shock waves and high reflection waves linking or relating the auxiliary system and the original or complete system. This is the original system in the evolutionary form. We have the derivative of the fractional flow with respect to saturation. Here is the, all the derivatives of the concentrations. And here is the part of the matrix in the evolutionary form, linked, let's say that, with the concentration transition of the solution. If we write, if we write the same for the auxiliary system, here matrix A is composed by the derivatives of the absorption with the respect of the concentration. So based on this matrix, matrices, we can relate the eigenvalues of the original system and the auxiliary system. Interesting is that the first eigenvalue of this system is the fractional flow derivative. It's the classical solution of the Buckley leverage. So we we consider we find that we have the we may have of course the a part of the solution that is composed exactly by the solution of the Buckley leverage problem. And if as we don't have um, a problem similar to gas dynamics, that one speed is always smaller or greater than the other one, this eigenvalue or this part of the solution may appear at any point of the problem. And all the transitions of the concentrations, the eigenvalue of the original system is linked to the eigenvalue of the auxiliary system. So it leads us to, the, to understand that if we have the auxiliary system solution, and we have the eigenvalue pointing at any direction. This is the projection of the left eigenvalue of the original solution. And the component and the first component of this eigenvalue is exactly the change of saturation. If saturation is kept constant, of course, it does not have to, but if it's kept constant, it will be uh, parallel to the concentration space. So it's easier to, at least for me, it's easier to think in a two component system. You have the 
saturation component one and component two. So we solved the auxiliary system. We made all the transition of the concentration in this plane. And then we have to lift the solution for the saturation problem, right? And this is an interesting point that I, I didn't have the chance to, to evaluate. And I don't know if I have the background, of course, but how can, it is a question, it's not an answer. Uh, how can we handle, because let's say a two by two system, concentration one and two, we have two human invariants. So what can we find or picture from this to the three by three system? Is that three human invariants? How do we relate that? I, I don't know how to handle that. It's just uh, a question that I'm, I'm putting here. How do we, can we see this? Human invariants from the auxiliary system and the or general system. So uh, we can follow the same procedure. Adolfo, can I ask a question? Of course, no problem. I, it's it's good to uh, know because uh, it, I I have to say because I'm not still very used to teach classes and, and seminars or so on. Yeah. And it's online because <laughs> I never know if people are listening. Of course, go ahead, Evelyn. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, don't don't worry. No, we are listening very carefully. Can we return <laughs> to the previous slide? Of course. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, if I understand uh, correctly, for the auxiliary system, you know the system of Riemann invariance, yes? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, if it's a two by two, I know. Uh, I don't know the end components. Ah. No, uh, I mean, it, I, I, I think sorry, it was sorry, in the know. work of... Uh, uh -huh. Sorry, let's say, for the particular case of the um, Langmuir adsorption isotherm, he, Aris, and Amundsen shown, have shown the Hema invariance. So in this case, we know, but I'm saying in general. Yes, yes, I understand you. Uh-huh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yes, in yeah. general, I don't know. <laughs> yes, in general, I don't know. For, um, for any adsorption isotherm, I don't know. But for the particular case of the Langmuir adsorption isotherm, we know all the human invariants. That's right, you're right. So, uh, but the point is, I say that we have N him and human invariants for the auxiliary system. Uh, but can I say that we have N plus one? I don't know. That's the. The point is that my doubt is that because how do we relate that with the yeah, general yeah. system with the saturation? I don't know. But uh, uh, could you explain maybe later uh, the this uh, lifting procedure? I mean, yes, so, yes, uh, yes, sure, sure. And okay. that I have this. Mm -hmm. um, I have some slides on that. Uh, and so it's the um, it's the same uh, for the rarefaction waves. We find the right eigenvector for the first wave. It's one zero. It's already known, and we can do the same procedure for the auxiliary system and general system. And what we see is that we have uh, a constant here, and the right eigenvector. Let's say the first component. It's uh, it's a constant, but when I mean it's constant, it's not a number, it's maybe a function, but it's a constant. And a right eigenvector of the auxiliary system. So we don't know the first component of the right eigenvector because all the other components of the right eigenvector are found from the auxiliary system solution. So it's the same way. If I find the rarefaction waves, the, the trajectory of the solution in the concentration space, I just need to lift the solution for the saturation part and calculate this, um, this first component of the right angle vector. And if we have a rarefaction wave of constant concentration, exactly the rarefaction wave of the Buckley level solution. And we have it's a vertical. We have a, a point here of constant concentration, and we just follow the saturation here in the space. But what will happen if we have uh, equivalence of eigenvalues because you divide by them? So I'm what sorry, if, uh, what if lam lambda i is equal to lambda zero? 
Uh, because it's in a denominator. So you're saying that gamma what? Uh, okay, I, no, this, the first one is not um, the first component here. Yes. It's for E equal two. Uh, equal one because here we call zero, right? The first one is one zero. The second one, it's no, uh, I, okay. I understand that, but it can still be equal at some points. Ah, I see. Uh, you, you say at the points of the okay, incidence, yes. Yes, I know. Yes, this is a is a problem. Yes. At the at the coinciding point, you say at the semi shock. Right? Uh, probably. Um... Yes. Yes. This is a problem. Yes. We're at the same shock. Okay. The we do the same for the shock waves, right? This is the shock waves for the general system, and and we had fractional flow jump divided by saturation jump with const constant concentration. This is what we call Buckley lever shot. And it's actually similar to high defection wave. We have just the saturation jump and const constant concentration. The auxiliary system shocks are given by the concentration jump divided by absorption jump. And then we can relate the concentration shocks as we have exactly at the point you pointed out that when you have a coinciding point here, and this is the jump of the concentration shock. Once we know the concentration shock at the auxiliary system, we have just the lifting, let's say, relating the velocity of the shock of the general system with the jump of the auxiliary system. So we have all the elementary waves related to the elementary waves of the auxiliary system. So this uh, is, yes. And uh, what about the visibility conditions for the shock waves? Uh, yes, um, this we have to do for each one. With, with lax, and uh, we we have proved lax and olenic also, but we we do that in the let's say at the final solution. Now, at this point, I, I just don't know how to prove. But when we map the solution, we I, we can show that it lacks it obeys lax, and in fact lax we can we can link both of them. But for the olenic condition. We just, I just could show that when we have the solution, uh, what we do is that we consider that it's okay. And, and then when we have the final solution, we test the Olenic solution for each case. Right? We, we show that all the possible um, jumps from minus to net obey the, obey the, um, Olenic condition. We we also do the, the vanishing viscosity test, but this is numerical, right? So we test also the numerical, um, okay. numerically the vanishing viscosity. So we I'm don't sorry, have a formal know. proof that it works in any condition. We but just, uh, yes. uh, but uh, Olenic condition is for scalar equations only. How do you apply it to systems? Right. So, sorry? Olenic condition is only applicable for scalar systems, so for a system of one equation. So it's not applicable no, to a system. No, I, I, sorry, I'm sorry, you're right. I, I'm saying about lax condition. Uh -huh. Lax condition, we have to test each one. We okay. don't have a, a formal proof that it works in any condition. But we only do that at and the final solution. So uh, maybe one small comment. Yes. Yes. Uh, if uh, your relative permeability function mm -hmm. also depend on concentrations, yes, then yes. Uh, the Buckley-Leverett function could become non-monotone 
with respect yes. to concentrations in some sense. And, this, this and uh, usually they appear non-classical shocks that do that are not lux. So probably yes. Uh, yes. It, it does not work. It, this mm -hmm. this technique cannot work mm -hmm. if it's no monotonic no monotonic fractional flow functions we uh, you say regarding the concentrations, right? But between different fractional yes. flow functions. Yes, that's right. If they are not um, monotonic between fractional flow functions, you're right, it does not work. We don't have a formal proof. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, and here, just for an example, uh, we have a, a solution for, well, of course, not so. If we have a problem that the solution is composed by n shocks, uh, what we do is um, test after the solution of the concentrations, not test, we just relate the solution. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. We relate each part or each shock with the fractional flow shock. This is exactly what Johansen has shown for the problem of the equivalence of the one phase chromatography with the two phase multi-component chromatography. This is works, this has everything proved for, um, for um, a pair, a, two equations, in fact. It is a similar solution as it were, we're working with two equations. Let's say that for, each set of concentrations is one concentration. So it would be similar to, for each concentration, we have a fractional flow function instead of C, one polymer, one concentration, we have a set of concentrations. And this is the point that you will call the, the monotonic fractional flow functions. If it does not fit, the proofs are not, so we don't have a proof, not that I'm not correct. So suppose that we have a solution with n shocks, right? So there's a shock, a constant state, shock, constant state, and each velocity is something. We are not following any, uh, it's just in a general example. It may be language absorption isotherm, and isotherm, it doesn't matter. But so we have these n jumps. Then, as we relate the velocity of the auxiliary system to the velocity of the general system, we just map the velocities here and we just look for the coinciding, first point coinciding of the fractional flow function, exactly at the point you stress that the, the eigenvalues coincide. And then we have all the jumps, jumps matched here at each concentration, at each flow, fractional flow function for each set of concentration. So this is the solution in the fractional flow space. So it's similar to a two by two system. The difference is that for each fractional flow, we have a similar or a like two by two system. Right. But so far, it's only applicable to Riemann problem, right? So when we add slack, yes, at this point, only for Riemann problems, mm -hmm. only for continuous flooding, exactly. And then we have and the solution. What Sorry. happens if uh, they interact? So what happens if uh, the slacks interact with each yes, other? Yes, I will show that. Mm -hmm. and, and then this is the saturation solution for this problem. So we have all the saturations mapped here. And then after we map to XT space, we have the jumps, constant states, 
and the same for saturation. And note that we have here the saturation transition at the beginning of the solution. And we also have this buckler level solution at the end, corresponding exactly to this buckler level shock and to this affection wave. Yeah, you have the saturation transition and buckler level shock. But it's also possible to have uh, a rarefaction wave between those two shocks. So you have. Yes, yes, it's possible. Oh, 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 no. Yes. Yes. It's, it's uh, possible. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Depending on the on this transition solution, we can have saturations here and at any point. Uh, not depending on the velocity of the shock, etc. I just. Uh, presenting an example composed by n shock, but we could do the same for n refractions or any um, any combination. What happens is that in the regions of constant concentration and saturation changes, we have this eigenvalue here, so we have this refraction part. So we could have any saturation here in the uh, between two constant states or just link it to a semi shock. And at any point, those uh, projections and um, connections between systems hold at any point. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, at, at, or in fact, at any transition, the correct word is that at any transition. Suppose that this, this point is up here, then we have the hard affection and then the other shock. That's uh, because the the hard affection, only saturation hard affection follows the first, the first eigenvalue. If we have the transition between two waves, between two fractional flows, it's a concentration hard affection, it also holds because we have this relationship here. It can also be so that. So what we do is, um, let's say, step-by-step -step solution, let's say, for once we solve the auxiliary system, we just, for the self-similar solution only, right? Only for human problems. And then we, we plot the fractional flow here, and then we map the transitions following the eigenvalues and the shock speeds between regions, be between systems. So it's, uh, I just put an example of n shock, but could be n artifacts or any combination of that. It's easy to, <laughs> to plot. <laughs> so uh, before going to the, to the solution of the n component slug, uh, just briefly I go through the multi component chromatography of heat just to show how, um, how he shows the interactions between waves at each kind of waves. I'll not go through details because it's a little cumbersome, but just to make a relationship, this is the one phase chromatography equations. And this is the concentration, the, the sorry, the flow of the, um, the conservation of the amount, and this is the adsorption. And the dimensional lens, initial conditions, the difference that he calls, instead of injection, he calls the entry conditions. They must be different. And he shows how the velocity, the speeds are related to this derivative here. And he uses the language adsorption isotherm. This is the important point. And it's, here is our A, A. And this is the adsorption isotherm constant. And then he just classifies the um, Langmuir constant in this order here, the, mine, the, the smaller to the greatest. It's just a way of that. And he also he calls the relativity, relative adsorption constant. And just in his nomenclature, 
he doesn't work with concentrations. He works on five and develops, defines another variables. And here he calls, these are the human invariants here for each wave, right? And the interesting point is that the summation is one. What he claims is that he can change the concentration space to this omega space. Omega is a parameter that changes along one straight line. Okay, in this case, he proves that straight line. It's a parameter that changes along the straight lines. And the most important point, most important result that he shows is that for if you have any number of polymers at each part of the solution at each wave, only one omega changes. Let's say the first wave beginning at initial conditions, the first transition wave, be it a, a, a refraction or a shock, only omega one changes. Omega two and omega three keep, are kept constant, are constant, sorry, not kept, they are constant. From A to B, the second wave, only omega two changes. And the last wave from B to the entry or injection conditions, only omega trace, omega three, sorry, <laughs> changes. So it, this change of space from phi to omega allows this uh, change of structure. So he develops all the equations for the artifaction and shock waves, they are here with respect to the omegas that are found through this equation. So for any concentration set, we have the concentration set here. We have phi. If we have phi, we have n, right? This is phi. So for each set of concentrations, we can find a set of omegas. So the, at the initial condition, we have concentration one, two, three. We have omega one, two, three at initial. And then at entry, and then at every transition, we have a set of fixed omegas or fixed concentration. And what's interesting is that here, only omega one changes, omega two and three are constant, but all three concentrations change. For each omega one here, with omega two and three constant, all three concentrations change. So this is an homeomorphic map, right? And he also finds, shows that this, uh, this polynomial is uh, organizing this form. So we can, first we have initial and entry conditions. We have omega initial and omega entry. So we compare omega initial and omega entry. If it increases, is a high affection. If it decreases, is a shock. So is this a misprint or is the last inequality actually to the other side? Uh, here? No, no, not the last one, but this one. This one is wrong. Yes. Yes. Why is it different? No, no, sorry. This is wrong. Mm -hmm. This is wrong. This is a typo. OK. OK, it is wrong. So um, and then for each initial and then try condition you have, so we know that for every wave or for the transition of the first omega, we have halifaction or, or shock, doesn't matter. So we know that only omega one changes and then omega two and so on. So it changed from initial to entry, initial, uh, and depending on if it's an uh, illusion, it's a chromatograph cycle, and then we can calculate all the omegas. And for each intermediate state, we can recover the concentration through this expression here. So, yeah, of course, in this paper, he's uh, all the proofs and everything. A uh, little problem here changing slides, sorry. <laughs> Sometimes we have to be a little patient. Okay. 
okay let me try to i will close the the powerpoint here for some reason it's not working it's my computer sorry and people just a second i'll stop sharing and try to to do it again right yeah, sure. yeah okay Okay, let's see if it works now. We see your screen. I know, but uh, the problem is that I'm not uh, moving the slides here. Oh. I'll try again. Let me try now. So we don't see a screen yet. Okay. Now let's see. Oh, now we see. Yeah, I, now know, we see. Problem, I know, but I, for some reason I'm not moving the. I will try uh, to close it? my. Yeah, I can. I cannot move the slides here. I will, I will close the. The PowerPoint here and try. Probably to you screen. can show PowerPoint, not the full screen, but still PowerPoint. Let me try again. I don't know if it, it looks fine because it's, I, I believe it keeps small, I don't know. Let me try again. Okay. Let's see again. Oh, come on, I'll try to do PowerPoint there because I don't know what to else to do. Can you see? Yes. But is it clear? Or yeah, we can more? see. Yeah, we can see very well. Okay, sorry, <laughs> but. I'll not keep wasting the time. But okay, but let's see. Yeah. Okay, here this is the the most important point, and they show that they have the heme invariants and they develop those relations linking, let's say the phi space with the omega space, and this is interesting because we can map we can map the. We can map this phi condition to the omega condition. Let me try to do something here. Okay. So, uh, and the important point is that the 
omega is constant, only one omega changes along each transition. And then what we have, like I said, if the entry is greater than the initial condition, we have a rarefaction wave. And if the entry or the injection condition is smaller than the initial condition, we have a shock. And then here we have the shock and hard effection equations. I don't know why the pointer is also not working here. <laughs> okay. And so we have the entry condition here at the left. Then we have a rarefaction wave that we call CM because it's the, uh, the less component. And then all of them uh, are changing here. Let's say you have N transitions here. Then we have a shock wave at K, you see here. Then another concentration, another hard effection wave. This is a general solution in XG plane. He's showing how the concentrations change along hard effections or in general way, right? And these are the equations between D. Of course, remember what is D here? Summation of one plus the concentrations from K, K and K minus one, the, we can fill up with as many hard effections you want. And this is the important point is that we have two cases. We have this in, a, in chromatographic problems. We have the saturation of a column when you inject the water or gas or anything with the multi-component dissolve it, and then they are selectively separated along the, the bed. Note that through each shock at the left plot, one of the components disappear. Let's say we have the components one, two, three at shock three. Three is the nomenclature, of course. Component three disappears. At shock two, component two disappears, and at shock one, component one disappears. So in your right condition, at the initial condition, there is no uh, absorbed component. This is saturation. And the elution of a column, we have the opposite. We inject on pure water, let's say, in a fully saturated bed. And then at each point, through a hard effection wave, one component appears. So along the third hard effection, component three appears. At the, along the second hard effection, component two appears. And along the first hard effection, all of them are there at the initial condition. And let's say the complete chromatogram is the combination of both. First, we inject um, the solvent with components to solve it, and they keep being adsorbed. And after some time, we inject pure solvent, and then the components are dissolved. And what called my attention is that this is similar to what we have in reservoirs. When we inject a slug of water containing polymers, what happens? The polymers begin being absorbed. And then we use pure water drive, and, and then the components begin being absorbed. So uh, what we have is a combination of them. Let's say for Langwe adsorption isotherm, this is an important point. Everything that I'm saying here is from Langwe. This initial this uh, condition here at the right appears after some time. So we have exactly the varying boundary condition problem. At time zero, you inject the slug with polymers. At time T, T1 or whatever, we inject pure water. So we have these shocks and all the affection that will have wave interactions along time and space. And also he works Shows, ah, shows the wave interactions. This is a uh, shock uh, interaction of two shocks of the same family. The interaction between a shock and a hard effection of the same family, you know, this in this case, the hard effection is absorbed, absorbed. 
uh, shocks of different fans, they are transmitted, the slopes change. And shocks, uh, sorry, a shock and a high affection of different waves, the, they are, both waves are transmitted also, you see shock is transmitted. And the, um, the interaction between high affections of different families. This is just the plot. The, all the equations are derived in heat papers, the one that I showed here. In this paper, all the equations are, are derived. I'm not, I'm not, uh, but this is important point. We'll, this is, let's make it brief. We, we related the general system of equations with, um, we call it Sealer system with only thermodynamics transitions. And this system is similar to pure chromatograph, one phase chromatograph cycle. And this is the problem that appears in reservoirs. We have the two phase chromatograph cycle. Johansen has shown how to solve the self-similar solution for the continuous injection of uh, polymers into a bed, into a reservoir. And now with these interactions, we could develop the solution for the problem of Inject, slug injection for language absorption of the term and a pure water drive. So just uh, being a little boring, but it's the same system of equations with the difference of the boundary conditions. You see x, g equals zero here. Uh, we change the dimension and time instead of pure uh, pore volume is injected, is number of slugs injected. And also at the boundary condition xg equals zero, we have always fractional flow equal one, it's always water, but we change the concentrations for any injection concentration to zero. And after one slug injected. Now here we apply the potential, and we get this system of equations. It's the we call the hyperbolic equation, but it's we can't call that lifting equation, whatever. And we have the boundary conditions for the xc space. And just for, because Try to present the solution for any number of components. It's uh, it's crazy <laughs> the number of waves. So we, I'll show here the number for three um, dissolved components. And at the end, of the, I just propose a general solution for any component. What's important to point here is that uh, to avoid those regions of different saturations for lying out not in the X or T axis. We just normalize the saturation with the initial and boundary saturations. So saturation will spend zero to one. And also the number of volumes injected becomes number of oil, oil is lug, more movable oil is lugs injected. So this is the initial and boundary conditions for this, let's say, new set of equations. But that would mean that you can't consider a case where, you know, initial concentration is uh, higher than something that you uh, see in the domain. So some oil banks, right? So this solution is bad for you because you have zero here, so you'll have negative concentrations, right? Uh, sorry, I don't know if I got your question, but. Uh, what I consider is that initial conditions, concentration is zero, right? Right. But uh, injection condition is not zero. Right, it's but, uh, but uh, you can achieve a saturation. Oh, it, uh, do you mean on the chemistry? Sorry. It's... 
Yes, this is the component. So the problem, ah, okay. mm -hmm. there, would, there would arise a problem if the injection concentration would be the same of initial concentration, regardless of zero, right? Let's suppose it's one. If the initial concentration is one and the injection concentration is one, is a problem. We cannot solve it using his technique. I don't know if even I, we can solve it. I just say that uh, if the injection is different from initial, there is no problem. Okay. Okay, and also when you change the boundary condition and uh, this new condition, let's say this new boundary condition will interact, will, will shock with the um, injection condition. So there is no problem with the same concentration. So let's focus on the auxiliary system and just writing three for the sake of simplicity. And just showing here the equations that appear in his work. These are the equations for the rarefaction waves as a function of omega and the shock waves of, as a function of omega. Remember how we calculate omega and we return to concentration through those summations and products presented there. And here are the equations for the interactions that will appear in this solution. The, the paper of he presents all the solutions, but I'm just showing here the interaction that we are going to use. The interaction between a K-harefaction and a J-shock, a K-shock and a J-harefaction, and uh, the same family waves that show that. I will not put here the plots again. So this is, can you see something? It's well, yes, yes, we can see. Really? I, I don't know how to. We can see that doesn't mean that we understand. <laughs> yes, but I, I will try to. Okay, uh, right. Let's look at the, the plot below. The problem is that I wanted to. You, do you see the pointer? I'm moving yes, here. Yes, we see no. the pointer. Okay, good, I found a way to <laughs> Let me try. Oh, so it, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I know. Ah, good, working again. Let's not celebrate. <laughs> there, there. I don't, don't ask me what happened. Ah, here, I don't know if it's good for you to read, but I believe it's better. So let me show you through the pointer here. Uh, at time zero, we begin injecting the three polymers. So here we have the three shocks because it's long we are sorted. So through every one of these shocks, one component will disappear. So for this region three, the last component disappears. This region two, two components disappear. And here, all of the components have disappeared, right? And here we have the hard effections that begin when we inject the pure water drive. So we have three hard effections. And then here we begin with the interactions between waves, characteristic hard effection waves and shocks following those expressions that we have already shown. And of course, if we take the big picture, other interactions will appear. Will appear. So what we have here is the initial concentration, initial concentration, the same. Here we have the injection concentration and between every family here, we have a constant state. See here? Are we yeah. assuming Langmuir is a term here? Sorry? Are we assuming Langmuir adsorption is a term in this picture? Langmuir, perfect, Langmuir. exactly. Langmuir, perfect, that's it. All the solutions are for Langmuir. All the equations that he developed are for Langmuir. Exactly, perfect. So uh, I know that's not readable, but what I mean here is that we have uh, 13 regions of the solution, although it goes only to 10 because we have eight, eight minus seven, seven minus six, six minus five, five minus five, two minus, right? So we have 16, sorry. And uh, have 13. No, 16, I was right. 16 regions in this plot here. 16 different regions. In each one, we have a constant state. See, region one, constant state initial. It's here. Region 10, 
constant state initial to and every constant state, let's say C minus, six minus, sorry. Six minus a constant state uh, with concentrations E, letter E, is the result of the interactions between these wave, the, the first halifaction wave in this region with this shock wave here. So uh, we mapped all these 16 regions from this characteristic diagram based on the equations of he and them. So these are the profiles for, we, we sliced the, the Y for every point. I know it's very hard to see, but it's here. It's V1, V2, V3, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this is the picture of the concentration profiles at every moment in, in, in phi along, it's equivalent to time, but we'll show in time later. So this is the first one, this is the self-similar solution, which we have the, all the concentrations here, and then we have the jump where each concentration disappears. Here the last one disappears, here the intermediate one disappears, here the first one disappears. So all of them come with the same concentration, then we have disappearance, and know that when the first one disappears, the concentration of the other two change. And the second one disappears, the concentration of the third one changes, and then we have the initial concentration. So when we begin the interaction between the hard effects here and the concentrations, phi2, what we have, the hard effects waves of each component, they have constant states, you see, one, two, three hard effects, and we have con constant states in this region, it's hard to see, I know, but between two of these hard effects, there is a constant state. And then constant states and the jumps from the, for these shocks here. And then it goes developing, you know that the, the jumps of the injection to initial condition begin disappearing as time evolves. And then the, the components begin to split in the reservoir. We have this peak of the concentration that begins to de decrease a long time. And then we have here the complete separation at the 11 frame, the complete separation of the components with concentrations much lower than the, even the initial one. Of course, as time goes to infinity, all of them will disappear. It's not physical, of course, only mathematical. Ah, come on. Okay. Then we solve the hyperbolic equation, right? We have the, we just call u and f just to get uh, simplicity to write. We call u the inverse of the fractional flow and f minus saturation divided by the fractional flow. Know that once we solve u and f, once we solve this fractional, this hyperbolic equation, we have from the u, we have the fractional flow. And from F solution, we have the saturation. As we already know the concentration at every region, we have all the solution for the saturation and concentration for our problem. So, and here just to see that along constant concentrations, the high effection waves will be the classical Buckley level, but FU. And when the concentration change, we have to solve this equation. Of course, that's why I call semi-analytical solution because we have to solve this uh, numerically. We don't have a specific solution for this expression. And this is the characteristic diagram for the hyperbolic equation. What's the difference? Okay, all the concentration transitions are mapped the same way because they are solved, but at every concentration, if it's a constant concentration wave, we have a constant saturation, or I have constant U and F. And if the concentration change, we have to solve this last equation to calculate U and F. So what appears 
So we can solve all the concentration transition using this equation. But besides that, we have two new conditions. We have this initial condition here that I will show you how they appear. We have initial concentration here, but we have a U transition here. And also in this region of between the velocity of the concentrations, the shock concentration, at the beginning of the water drive, we have a set of saturations here that will interact with this set of concentration halifactions and we will, we will have this uh, to calculate this solution, these transitions here using that expression here until we get to region 10. So for the U, when I say U is the saturation solution, we have to solve this region and also this transition here. How do we solve? Okay, just to, <laughs> this is the same uh, mapping or the same set of solutions for the concentration, it's here. But note that we have uh, a new halifaction wave for saturation with constant concentration and the constant saturation for the constant concentration. It's exactly if we link for the self-similar solution at the beginning of the transition of the saturation with the first fractional flow function where the concentration is constant. And here is the same, we have 11 regions, solution, I, we split the solution in the fee, it's sliced in 11 regions. And I will show one example here. And you know, this paper that I published with Felipe, it's, I can send you both, of course, if you want the paper. And there is also supplementary material that we, present all these solutions. The paper is very short. We cannot put all the solutions, but I will send you, I sent to you, Landon, and a supplementary material that presents all these detailed solutions, right? And the, and the plots and everything. And so it's the self-similar region that I'm showing here. It's U1 for phi, smaller than one before the injection of the slug. So we have this solution here. It's self-similar, but I do not write it self-similar because all of the others are not self-similar anymore. So that's why I said that those regions appear. We, what, how do we do that? That we call the lifting equation. That's one of the points. We plot here all the concentration set. For each concentration set, we have a fractional flow function. So we have a FU function, S divided by F against one divided by F for each set of concentration. So let's say smaller than one, we have this three here, right? And, and then we plot all those possible concentrations. Of course, here we plot a little more. And what happens? The saturation transition or the U transition begins at the initial fractional flow function, right? From plus and minus infinity to here. And, and then it, it's a jump for here. Then we have a high fraction and 2.1. And then we have a set of jumps until a high fraction 2.j. It's similar. I will show you the fractional flow function against saturation. The similar solution structure. It's a shock to point I plus. And this nomenclature, if you read the paper, is and then I had a fraction to point one, then three jumps, and then another had a fraction to point J. You know that this region here and this region here, they did not appear in the concentration solution. It's exactly this region here and this region here. Of course, as long as other concentrations, high factions appear here, more complicated the, the solution will appear here. And of course, many more of these fractional floods have to appear. And you see all these jumps here are calculated by this equation. 
And then the final point is the inverse mapping. This is just the integral of the Lagrangian coordinate change. So where we have d phi divided by x, we have the speed of the auxiliary system solution. Then we have s divided by f is exactly u. And here we have f is exactly the f solution. So we have all the fractional flow function and saturation solution because we have the trajectory of the u and f. We have all those points u and f here. So we have the fractional flow and the saturation. So we have fractional flow saturation. We have the speeds in the xt space. We adopt also this relationship for the viscosity. And then this is the mapping in the xt plane. Uh, sorry, you just a question. It's already 11.5 or in your times 5.5. Five, five. Is it okay? 10 more minutes? Uh, well, I think it's okay, yes. I don't want. Well, at least for me, it's okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. All right. So this is the mapping of that solution. The, the only difference is exactly the same. The only difference that instead of x phi, it's x t. And the same regions, instead of writing u, is the saturation. So this is the mapping of the saturation, exactly all the 11 regions. And this is the solution for S, this first part, the self-similar part of the solution. And here is the profile of the solution. Note we have from J, a higher effection to 0.4, and then a jump to 0.3, a point to jump to saturation two, a point to saturation one, constant state, and then a higher effection to what we call I plus, and then the back play level jump to SI. These are three frames because it's self-similar solution, it's easy to plot. And then is the same transition in FS plane. Remember that point, the, the question that you stress that some rarefaction waves may appear, and that's the point you see. There's a rarefaction here for pure concentration, and there's another hard effect in here for constant concentration and the jump, buckler level jump here. And the main point of the presentation is already done. Just to, we develop some work on the, okay, for N components, of course, writing something like that would be cumbersome, but what we have is that for N components, we have N plus one square, regions, those regions in the concentration diagram that we had for 16 regions, for three components, we, we solved it for four and then we saw that it was fine. We also developed a general um, technique, let's say, not a good word, but a general procedure for solving the saturation profile. And this is an important point. Note that we have uh, constant saturation regions between uh, concentration hard effections. And after the chromatograph cycle has completely developed, we have water banks, pure water banks among concentration regions. We, after the chromatograph cycle is developed, when, when we see in that concentration frames that we have all the components split between them, we have pure water banks, not, of course, with oil, but not um, with no concentration. So the general solution is that we have a, a saturation, constant states, hard effects, concentration, hard effects, jumps for constant saturation, followed by concentration, hard effects, and jump. This is a general solution until we have the jump for that S1. This saturation, hard effects may appear or not, depending on the bulk level jump. So if it does not appear, we have a constant state and then a jump. This is the general case when we have the satur uh, saturation um, transition before the Butler level jump. Okay, sorry for the- Excuse me, can you show the previous slide? 
And these are some research topics that we are ongoing for miscible flooding, partially miscible VAG injection, low salinity, and others. And um, okay, it's possible with my Brazilian accent. <laughs> okay, guys, thanks for your attention. Sorry for the long, long presentation that for the, those problems with my frame and my presentation. Oh, thank you very and much. Thank you very much, Adolfo. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs> and please feel, feel free for any questions.